St. Paul the Apostle says, Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Let's talk about Pastor Phage. I mean, this, <laughs> this passage from 2 Corinthians is just, you know, boy, it just goes to the heart of every pastor. And especially those of us who are in the, uh, you know, as I like to say, in the, if, you know, second half, you know, third quarter, but second half of life, we, we more and more begin to understand St. Paul the Apostle's weakness and how God might work through that. However, see, speaking of St. Paul, St. Paul certainly in his letters, and, with, and they give, and actually the Apostles gives every indication that Paul obeyed the standards of rhetoric of his time, and being in Paul's, you know, in, you know, following Paul's example, as Paul himself commends, and to observe the rules of rhetoric, which would indicate in our culture that you cannot allow an occasion to pass by without remarking on it, that occasion being that this is the fourth day of July, right? A national holiday. So, simply and in brief, Christians, followers of Jesus, can be wholehearted supporters of the American nation state in so far, this is going to be like the executive summary, then we're going to get to the text because this is, I love St. Paul, we're going to get into St. Paul. But can be wholehearted supporters of the nation state in so far as we lean into the opportunity that America in particular has to be, number one, an Isaiah 60, 65 nation. That is, in Isaiah 65, it's the vision of all the peoples of the earth streaming to Mount Zion, right? It's a, it's a vision, it's a universal, universalistic vision in the prophet Isaiah, in which, again, all the peoples of the earth come together to be one people worshiping Israel's God. And may we be called as a people, in a sense, we among so few nations are a nation where I think if we picked out any, all the other nations, there would be people from that nation in the United States, right? For example, there would, there would be people from the United States who are from Zimbabwe and from Nepal, but I'm not sure that in Nepal there are people from Zimbabwe, or in Zimbabwe there are people from Nepal. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay? So that's what I'm saying is this unique vocation and opportunity that America, qua America has as a nation of immigrants to be an Isaiah 65 kind of place where the peoples of the earth can gather together in peace and joy to be the people of God. If we can be agents of God's work in leaning into those possibilities, followers of Jesus, let's do that. Let's lean in to the possibilities of welcoming all the peoples of the earth and becoming a people together. Insofar as America has the opportunity to be a Pentecost too, or I mean an Acts 2 Pentecost nation, right? In which the peoples of the earth, the Israel, remember that list of all the nations. You got Cretans, you got Arabs, you got, you know, people from, you know, the, you know, all these different islands and Cyprus, et cetera, et cetera. And they all heard the word in their own language. Can we be a people who has Jesus' followers in this land? be a people who can bring the good news of Jesus' love and help people hear that in whatever language they speak. And it may not be actually a language in terms of actual, like, a, a, a spoken language, but the language of their background, the language of their struggle. Can they hear the good news spoken in the language of struggle, in the language of justice? in the language of joy, overcoming sorrow. Can we speak the good news that way? So, on this 4th of July, let us all, as followers of Jesus, who are called to live here in the United States of America and be a witness to him, lean into an identity of wanting to be agents of a nation that is a nation in which good news of God's love can be heard by everyone. That, that's a mission I can get on board with, right? And as someone who taught the Pledge of Allegiance, the little, you know, little Cub Scouts, I did, a, I did that for a long time, and I taught flag etiquette, you know, and folding the flag, and, you know, do it, running up the pole, and all that stuff. So, I mean, I taught that, and I meant it when I taught it, right? 
I still do. But when we say I pledge allegiance, one of the beautiful things about this, the nation to which we pledge allegiance when we say that, is that we pledge allegiance to a nation that does not expect itself to be our first allegiance. And that is the beauty of the United States of America. When it, is, when it fulfills the promise of its constitutional ordering. That's the beauty of the United States of America, when it fulfills the promise of its constitutional ordering, that when we pledge allegiance, it is not our first allegiance. And we can always say that with a little asterisk, saying that our first allegiance is to Jesus Messiah. And that's okay, and it's actually encouraged when we're at our best, when we're at our best, at least from a Christian point of view. All right, that's July 4th. Now we got Paul, all right? We got Paul, and great stuff of Paul. So let me walk, this is gonna be one of those sermons where I just kind of walk you through this passage and kind of help you see what's going on here because it's so beautiful. So basically, so Paul starts this passage, if you have your leaflets, and again, as I like to say, you can take your leaflets and transfer notes to your Bible, your study Bible at home that I know is well-worn. And so Paul starts out this passage in 2 Corinthians relating what we call his Damascus experience, right? So again, when we date this, we, the, the New Testament scholars, we think that the 2 Corinthians written about AD 54 because there are certain things that are referenced between Acts of the Apostles and Corinthians that... There, you know, and there's some inscriptions in the ruins of Corinth. It's like, oh, that's the guy they were talking about. So we, we can pretty much date this letter to around AD 54. So he says about 14 years ago, which puts it to AD 40, crucifixion of Jesus, AD 33, around, right? And so time for the movement to get going, and then Paul to become a persecutor of it, and that's it. So, so basically what he's saying, what he's describing 14 years ago is what an Acts of the Apostles is kind of the Damascus Road experience. Now he described it in a very different way than Acts of the Apostles. You might miss it because like, wait a second, there's like the horse and he falls off the horse or, you know, and then there's a bright light and Saul, Saul, why not that person? You know, there's none of that. But what Saul, what, what Paul is relating here is that basically I was in God's space. That's what he means by the third heaven. The third heaven is, this isn't some sort of like, you know, Gnostic cosmo, anyway, is, that's nerdy. So it's the third heaven is like, so basically first heaven would be where like, kind of like in the air where the birds are. Second heaven would be kind of where this heavenly bodies, the stars are. The third heaven is like above the stars, i.e. where God is, right? So, so what, when Paul uses the language available to him, to talk about his experience, he's basically saying, I didn't get pulled up into Starland. By the way, that's where the Caesars, when they died, were supposed to go. That Julius Caesar, you know, when he died, there was supposed to be, there was an omen, because there was a, a shooting star or a comet that came through. It's like, oh, there's the soul of Julius Caesar. He's with the stars now. So Paul says, I'm, I'm not with where the Caesars go. I was above that, right? I was with God and he met the risen Jesus. This experience was so powerful. This is what started the Paul that we know in his mission. This is what transformed Saul to Paul, this experience of coming into God's presence and meeting the risen Jesus in a way that Paul will forever after say, I'm equal to Peter and those guys. I met the risen Jesus. I'm, now, I had this experience that makes me equal to the apostles in Jerusalem. See, blood of the Galatians. But it's different from the way that you Corinthians meet Jesus. I mean, Paul said, you know, there's that basically you Corinthians meet Jesus through faith. I met him like, you know, now he said, now whether I mean, it was in the body I met him or just, you know, there was a soul event, I don't know, because he says that. That's what he says. I, I, and it's like, basically, I don't care. That's saying, God knows. What this, what this language of God knows is this is invoking Ezekiel. You know, mortal. You know, mortal, command these bones to rise, and, and then they such, you know, can this happen, Lord? Lord, you know, right? So he's evoking the language of the prophets of Israel to describe his experience. So all I'm, all I'm doing is basically saying that this is Paul's, like, 
come to Jesus moment, right? That starts his whole mission, his whole identity is wrapped up in this. And what he does is he says, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm just gonna bracket that and we're gonna put it to the side. I mean, think about your own lives, brothers and sisters. Think about, is there an experience in your life that was like a watershed moment that made you who you are and in a sense that you know you would share, if anybody knew you, you'd have to get around to sharing that with them. If they're gonna be a friend of yours, and imagine taking that the most meaningful, impactful experience in your life and saying, you know what, we're gonna bracket that and I'm just gonna treat it like it was nothing special. We're gonna relate on some other ground because I, you know what, I can't share my experience with you. That's what Paul's saying. Basically, I can't share the experience I had with the risen Jesus with you. But what I do share with you is my life. What you, what he says, what you've seen in me and heard in me. In other words, I was there with you. We were doing life for like two years in Corinth, right? You saw me. That's how you saw Jesus in me. Not because I had a spiritual experience, a mystical experience, which was very, nonetheless very real, but he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bracket what makes me special, what makes me apostolic, what would give me the right to tell you Corinthians what it is you ought to be doing. I'm gonna bracket that off to one side. And instead, I'm gonna come to you on a different ground. Okay, so that's been done. Step one. So what is the ground upon which Paul is going to come to meet the Corinthians to be their pastor, to be their spiritual leader? The ground of his suffering. He says, he says you know, I had this experience at, uh, with, with the risen Jesus and that changed my life forever. But then I got this thorn in the flesh. Now scholars said, boy, I mean, ink has been spilt on what this thorn might have been. And there are two primary contenders. Number one, it's possible that from, judging from the letter to the Galatians, when Paul says, you, when I came to Galatia, basically I was just beaten and battered, and I had something, he said, you didn't squint your, you didn't give me the evil eye. He said, you didn't squint your eye at me. Instead, you would have taken out your eye to give it to me. Now we wonder, was, did, did Paul have some sort of like an eye abscess or, you know, we wonder how literally that language should be taken. Like you would have given, you know, like my arm was bad, you would have given me your own right arm is basically the expression. Or was Paul actually using a proverbial expression like you love someone so much you give out your right eye to them. You know, we don't know. So the other contender is that when Paul talks about the messenger of Satan, of the accuser, Basically, of uh, the one who says, for Paul, the, what this, the way that the Satan would function would be the one who would try to convince Paul that his mission to the Gentiles, the transformation that Jesus made in him, was to no effect, was a waste of time, was, you know, God didn't care. The accuser, the one who says, God doesn't love you, That's just, that was just in your head, Paul. That's the, sit the Satan, the liar. And so, so what is this messenger of the Satan? We wonder if that's actually Paul's own sufferings as he went from town to town and his rejection by his own kinsmen in the flesh, that he would go from town to town to the Jewish people, to the people who, I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, and he would go from town to town and find his kinsmen, which under normal circumstances in those days, you would show up to the synagogue. If you were a Jewish traveler, you'd show up to the synagogue and say, hey, my camel busted a tire back two miles out from town. Can you kind of give me some help and transfer the bird, you know? You, and there's, oh, sure, let's all go. Hey, everybody, let's all go there and help our brother Saul. That sort of love and acceptance and inclusion and family, Paul goes from place to place and he is rejected by those people in every place he goes because he's saying that Jesus Messiah has come to deliver us from the power of sin and death. The Messiah has come, but he was crucified. It's like record scratch right there, right? Crucified Messiah, no go. We can't do it. And, he, and, and so I, like when he gets rejected and cursed out, literally, that's the, best, that's the best option. Sometimes he gets beaten, sometimes he's scourged, he's thrown in prison, etc., etc. So in all these ways, right, Paul is 
rejected and beaten up. And so we wonder if the, re the messenger from the Satan is Paul's own sense of failure with his mission to his own people, right? And so he says, listen, I haven't been that good on the road, you know, to the Corinthians. I haven't, I haven't done that well. So either he has marks in his body as a disease, and he says, I asked three times for the Lord to take this away. Was it literally three? Basically three times means going, going, God, right? It means I really asked. You know, I mean, I really meant it. I, I did it three times, right? Like when Peter denied, and then when Jesus asked him to love him three times. So Peter said, Paul says, I did it three times I asked. And so he says, so then he, so notice he says, I'm not going to boast about the special spiritual experience I had that makes me superior to all of you and gives me rights over you. What he boasts of, and he says, I speak as a fool, is a prayer to which God said no. Think about it. He says to the Corinthians, the ground upon which we, sh the ground we share is the ground where even I, Paul, asked God for something I really wanted and God said no. Now, is that a shared experience? Could we all sit in a circle and share multiple times when we have offered up a threefold prayer to God because we really, really meant it and God said N-O? You bet you could. It is on the ground of his suffering with the Corinthians, on the ground of his vulnerability, on the ground of his weakness, on the ground of his powerlessness, Paul says that's our shared ground in Jesus Messiah because he was crucified for the sins of the world. That is to say, he became weak, vulnerable. He suffered for us. When he said to the Father, let this cup be taken away from me, God the Father said, no. And so therefore, when we suffer, Brothers and sisters, when we suffer and offer that suffering up to God the Father through Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to allow Jesus' suffering, his Jesus' weakness, Jesus' being a loser, Jesus' failure to be something that is, tr and to allow that to be transformed with that suffering, with that failure, with that death, which means all of those things, right, when a capital D, into victory, into the victory of God's love given through powerless forgiveness. God's love given in mercy, not in coercion, not in saying, God has appointed me in charge, and you all, you all Corinthians better be doing what I'm saying, because I, you know, I got a hotline. I could dial in the airstrike at any time. Right? What a temptation. And do we not see that spiritual abuse across the Christian church in our culture? But Paul specifically rejects that model of leadership. He specifically rejects the ground of success and shininess and glory and power as the ground of Christian fellowship, let alone leadership. He says the ground of weakness is the ground upon which we can meet. The ground of suffering is the only thing we share. Yet what marks us out as God's people is the ability to allow that suffering to be something from which we gain the strength to love others who suffer. That's good, dude. That's gospel. That's gospel. That's Paul's gospel. To the Corinthians and to us. That's why he can say, right, because Paul is saying, in my life, I am trying to order myself. I am imitating the Messiah. And he says, imitate, to the, Im, to the, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. That is, allow your life to become cruciform in shape. To become one that is marked by the power of of suffering love, the power of powerlessness. Allow your life to show the force of mercy. 
That's that paradoxical Jesus way into which we are invited to walk by Paul and by the gospel of Jesus Messiah that he announces. To allow our capacity to suffer, our vulnerability to be transformed by Jesus' cross and resurrection into a sign of God's infinite patience, mercy, and love. Thus love, God's love in Jesus is the perfect, complete power in the cosmos, in the creation. Right? This is what it this is what makes Paul make sense. My weakness is made perfect. Right? Or my, my power is made perfect in my weakness. Because it's Jesus' power made perfect on the cross. Vindicated in the resurrection. Okay. So what Paul Paul what Paul tells, I like to say what Paul tells, the gospel shows. And so we have this, and I gotta spend just a few minutes on this lesson from I mean you're after you're here, you're here on a hot day. I'm like I'm getting like revival time because we're in a hot day, we got bands going on, it's like it's like under our tent, we got the doors open. There, thank you. <laughs> Jesus shows with the sending of his followers in their transformational mission, right? So notice what Jesus does. Just kind of, let, you know, this second paragraph of, of today's gospel lesson. He says, now take a staff, but don't take any money. What? How can you, how can you have a mission about money? I mean, he's like, you know, you got various expenses. You got, I've got my, you know, I've got my per diem going on here. I've got, you know, there are meals, there's entertainment. I mean, you, know, you can't just show up to a village and say, and Jesus said, yes, you have to show up to a village and say, help. You have to show up to a village and say, I need you. I mean, like, not for the kingdom, but I just need you to help me, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, don't take two tunics. That is, and so what is that about? It's like basically one to use as a sleeping bag. That's why you take two tunics on a journey. One to wear as a coat, one to wrap your stuff in, and then use as a sleeping bag at night, in the, you know, in a chilly, you know, Galilee in springtime or winter. And so he said, no, just take one. You don't have any stuff to wrap up anyway, right? And go on out. In other words, he sends them out in vulnerability. He sends them out in weakness. He sends them out in such a way that, I mean, I mean, if Jesus wanted to make it rain, he could. It's like, here, look what I found, a bag full of gold. I just made it. Right? He could have done that. But he did not for a reason. Because he wanted to send them out to be looking as unimpressive as possible. So that the only thing they have to offer is Jesus's good news. Is the love of God the Father reflected in acts of healing, in transformed lives. Right? And transformation is something that you can pay for. It's not something you can buy. It's something that you receive as a gift. And they are there to give gifts, not bribes. That's the economy of the kingdom of God, which they are called. And so notice what the, and so in the, in the lesson, if, it, if you have a little pencil, it's like, note how it doubles down on how the, when the disciples, they, they ask people to repent and they proclaimed all, they, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Many, so like two many, right? Up in the paragraph above, this is how I think of it. You see that I'm going to read it. So up in the paragraph above, notice that Jesus, except he laid hands on a few sick people. In a sense, what the gospel seems to suggest is that if you really live this out, you will do greater things than these. I think it was Mark Twain that said that or something, you know, but there's somebody said that if you're faithful that you will see yet even greater things than these. And if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, if we are willing to stand with those who suffer in solidarity with them, even if our suffering is different, especially if our suffering is different from theirs, many, many lives can be changed by just a few people. Just a few people is all it takes. It just takes a few faithful people. You see, Jesus doesn't require strength or prior success from us. 
What he asks for is the Greek word pistis. And I've come back, it's, it's translated belief or faith. So in, some, in this translation it says he was amazed by their unbelief. In other translations it will say he was amazed by their lack of faith. But I've preached on this again and again, and so like again, I'll repeat it until we all get it, right? Pistis can basically, the faith is not something that, or the, the word pistis, this is not first and for, is first and foremost neither a body of beliefs, nor is it a function of the heart and mind. Can you just believe in it? You know, he is like, they, they just didn't want it bad. It's not, it's like, what the gospel is not saying is that the people in Nazareth just didn't want it enough, right? They didn't allow, that's prosperity gospel, right? You just got to want it more. And then it's, it's, so it's your fault you're sick because if you wanted it more, God will give it to you. See, that's prosperity stuff. What this is about, what this pistis is about is trust. Especially in John's gospel, pistis should be translated trust. Trust that I'm from the Father. Trust that I will raise them from on the last day. Trust in God's love. And in the Gospels and in Paul, it could also be translated in some context, loyalty. Right? Loyalty. If, there, there, if you think about it, trust and loyalty like work together in a marriage, don't they? Right? Trust and loyalty. They, they work hand in hand. They're kind of part of the same thing. If you don't trust, you're not going to be loyal. Right? You can't be, you know, if you're not loyal, no one's going to trust you. And that's what this word pistis has both those meanings in it. So he was amazed at their lack of trust in him, and in a sense their lack of loyalty, because after all they're his his kin. It's his hometown, right? He's got they name all the heads of the households in, in that are related to him, all the cousins. It's like, you know, the Adelphoi, you know, you know, the, the cousins, you know, his brothers and sisters amongst us. And so they and so he says, you know, they're my family. And they don't even, they're not even loyal to me. So in contrast to the disloyalty, the apistis of his kin, who's transformed? Who's transformed? A few sick people. Weak people. Suffering people. Vulnerable people. They have what it takes to be in a relationship with Jesus Messiah. The force of this little story in Mark's Gospel, the challenge of this little, little story in Mark's Gospel, is that unless you can get over yourself and your self-sufficiency, and you're, hey, where did you where get all this stuff? All this kingdom of God stuff. Where did where'd that come from? We all know him. Unless you can get over the familiarity that you have with the gospel, which breeds contempt. You'll never have pissed us. You'll never be able to be loyal. That our trust in Jesus and our loyalty to him comes once again when we reckon with and accept our own vulnerability, weakness, and suffering. That's good news if you're sick. And brothers and sisters, as a fellow patient in the hospital, let me tell you, we're all sick. We all need Jesus to heal us. So let's have that trust in him. And let's allow Jesus' power to be shown in our weakness. Amen.